Superstorm Sandy, a live town hall. October 29, 2012, Hurricane Sandy slowed down, turned toward the shore, and struck. I came back, I said, oh my God, look at the water. Within hours, no power for tens of millions. Everybody waiting for electricity. Hell, we ain't got no light. No gasoline. Seaside Heights is completely flooded. Homes and businesses gone. You can't appreciate this until you're on the ground. Massive fires, transportation halted, hospitals evacuated, the shoreline washed away. That was Superstorm Sandy. Tonight from New York and New Jersey Public Television Stations 13, WLIW and NJTV, WHYY-TV Philadelphia, WNYC 93.9 FM and AM820, New Jersey Public Radio, The Star Ledger and NJ.com, NJ Spotlight, NJ News Commons and The New York Times. This program is made possible by the New Jersey Recovery Fund at the Community Foundation of New Jersey, the General Contractors Association of New York, New York Building Congress and New York Building Foundation, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, New Jersey Manufacturers, Parsons Brinkerhoff, Tishman and Acom Company, STV and the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York. And now, live from Monmouth University, here is Mike Schneider. Good evening to you and welcome to the Pollock Theater here on the campus of Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey and in New York City at our Lincoln Center Studios, the Tisch WNET Studios. Welcome. Tonight we bring you a live town hall event, Superstorm Sandy. What worked, what didn't, and what's next? We have gathered experts right here in New Jersey and in Lincoln Center in New York, representatives from government, engineering, utilities, conservation, science, and social service organizations. We also will be taking questions from members of our live audience and will use social media to take questions and comments from our viewers and listeners throughout the region. We invite you to join that conversation on Twitter using the hashtag SandyTownHall. You can also comment online on our live stream channel at SandyTownHall.org. First, we want to get started here with some ground rules. We want to get to as many topics as possible, as many questions as possible. So here in the Pollock Theater, we have chosen some audience members to ask questions live. And I'll also be relaying questions that have come to us via social media. Plus, we have sent our crews out throughout this huge disaster zone that we have called home to record some more questions that you will be hearing tonight. So you, you get our drift here. We have a lot of issues to address this evening. And we're asking all of our audiences here in New Jersey and in New York to be respectful and to refrain from disrupting the broadcast in any way. We know that emotions can be high, but we will ask anybody who is disruptive to leave. So let's get started right now. When this storm named Sandy headed north and then began to turn to the west, this was the worst possible path that a hurricane could take for our region. The damage totaled $50 billion and, you know, you've seen it. We're still struggling to rebuild our homes and our businesses and our communities. But the recovery was remarkable as well. New York City subways shut down the day before the storm hit. They began running again just four days later. The lights went out and stayed out for many, many millions of us. But utility companies reached out and did get help from around the country, and they got the power back on. So what did we learn? And what do we do next? We want to ask a few of our guests what they think the headline issue is some half year after the storm. As the late mayor of New York City, Ed Koch, used to say, how am I doing? The question now is, how are you doing? How are we all doing? The commissioner, Richard Constable, New Jersey's Department of Community Affairs. Let's start with you. What's the headline in your mind six months after? Well, in order to get to that headline, we have to do an analysis of where we came from. Um, as was indicated in the package, um, immediately before Sandy May landfall, the president declared a state of emergency here in the state of New Jersey. The governor declared a state of emergency. Some 115,000 of our neighbors were under a mandatory uh, evacuation order. Post landfall, some 7 million of our neighbors didn't have power. Um, some 7,000 were in shelters. And some 44,000 have been displaced. We have obviously um, come a long way in the six months since Sandy hit landfall. And we're now starting to return to a sense of normalcy. I live in Essex County. I wasn't as damaged as my friends from Monmouth and Ocean County. 
what we're about to embark on now is the next phase of the recovery, the rebuilding effort. Uh, the federal government recently passed a Sandy aid package of some $60 million, $16 million of which is focused on housing, uh, small businesses, and communities. Uh, my department is going to lead an effort to get monies out to homeowners that are in need so that they can help rebuild, um, as well as monies to small businesses and the like. I'm going to ask you to hold right there because we got the headline and we're going to come back for the details. Questions yeah. about how do you spend $1.8 billion dollars. To New York City right now, our studios at Lincoln Center, the former Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, Richard Ravitch. To you, sir, what is the headline as far as you're concerned? That a lot of good people in the professions, in public life, are thinking very hard about how they failed to do what actually a statute in existence prescribed and that is to have a plan and in anticipation of a natural disaster like this. And I think that that mistake will not be replicated again. And there are, will be in place a, both a procedural system for addressing it, a way to make sure that the businesses that respond uh, as they did instantly to the requests of the mayor and the governor get paid, uh, and there will be serious public discussion over these next few months as to where in the priority uh, list of projects to undertake do you place hardening the power grid because the most lasting damage other than the ones to, the, to families in their homes was the loss of power. And that, could, that can easily uh, uh, be avoided if such a tragedy were to occur again by hardening the power grid, and that's something that should be paid for by the government and not paid by the homeowners uh, in this region. Mr. Rabbit, you've led me exactly where I want to go to next. Back here in New Jersey, the president and COO of PSE&G, Ralph LaRosa. Your headline six months later. A lot of lessons learned, a lot more to be done. Uh, three areas of focus, I would say, that we, we have to continue to improve upon. One is communications, communications with our customers, communications across industries. The challenges that we had getting the gas stations up and running again is, is, is probably the most poignant one there. Um, we have to continue to uh, improve upon our logistical plan so that when a storm hits, we're ready. Uh, we were fortunate. We had all of our employees that, that, that needed equipment, had equipment, had places to sleep, were able to get gasoline throughout the whole storm. But... Um, we could improve upon that because it was a little bit bigger magnitude. We would have had some challenges. But more importantly, exactly what Mr. Ravage said, we have to harden the infrastructure. Uh, we have a program that we've proposed on that, and uh, you know, we're looking forward to having those conversations. But there's a lot that we can do based upon the new normal that we're seeing in the weather. Okay, with that in mind, here at this town hall, we have our first question. Sir, could you, you're at the microphone. Could you identify yourself, please, and ask your first question? Thanks. Uh, my name is Nate Kleinman. I'm an organizer with Occupy Sandy, New Jersey. Um, Occupy Sandy works in some of the most marginalized communities in New York and New Jersey. And um, I find it deeply troubling that now, um, even six months after the storm, I can go to a trailer park in South Jersey that was um, devastated with three, four feet of water, leading to unhealthy living conditions, molds, black mold to this day, and find people who have had no contact with FEMA, no contact with the state, with the Red Cross. Um, and, and this while people are getting checks for tens of thousands of dollars who live in beachfront homes. How is it that the people who are, who've fallen through the cracks are going to get help? And how can we make sure that their voices are heard in the long-term recovery process? Thank you very much for your question, sir. Thank Perhaps you. Uh, Mayor Zimmer, Don Zimmer of Hoboken, you certainly had to deal with an awful lot of this immediately thereafter. A lot of questions about how FEMA was going to or not cover some of the folks who lived in the so-called basement apartments and all the conditions there. You want to take a crack at that? Well, I think part of it is, uh, you know, I, I, and I've been advocating for this, but FEMA's approach is that they, they don't share data. So there's a lot of organizations, uh, you know, that, that want to come in and want to help. And, you know, the city we were working, we have a CERT team, Community Emergency Response Team, going out and helping. So if there was a sharing of data, it would be a lot easier to make sure that you're you're reaching everyone. But yeah, I mean, I have I have concerns about you know the some of the policies, and for me, I'm focused on 
urban, the urban environment and what the approach is in the urban environment, but I think that would be first and foremost is changing that approach and making it so that we're sharing data because there's so many organizations, the Red Cross, so many different organizations that want to come in and, and help. If there could be, if we could sort of let go of the concern about the Privacy Act, and, and I know it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge because you don't want lawsuits, but um, I think we need to shift and be focused during an emergency on, on getting all of that data together and trying to reach people as quickly as possible. Okay, we're gonna head back to Lincoln Center right now. Sheena Wright, the president and CEO of United Way of New York City. Obviously, this uh, must strike very close to home for you and some of the services you try to provide and some of the people you try to help. Why don't you take a crack at that question, if you would, please? Absolutely. I think it's a great question. There were many, many people that were already in poverty. 21% of the people in New York City are below the poverty line. So you have some of the most vulnerable communities and vulnerable members of those communities who absolutely were not prepared to face a disaster. And you have high, more highly resourced communities that could. And I would say, uh, you know, the headline for me is that we're really at the beginning of the, of the long-term recovery. I think it's unprecedented that the $60 billion of federal resources took almost six months to, to pass. And those resources really have not hit the ground. So the social service sector that stands in the gap that would go to these trailer parks and go to the public housing and really, you know, advocate for and help these most vulnerable re residents in our communities didn't have the resources and still largely do not to meet those needs. Uh, I want to stay at Lincoln Center right now. Joe Nocera, op-ed columnist, for the New York Times. You have written, and if I, if I read you correctly, you said in, in some ways this storm, the aftermath of this storm, actually has proven how much more effective individuals and nonprofit organizations can be in dealing with some of the issues, some of the fallout from a disaster like this. Do uh, you want to address that? Well, what choice do they have? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what choice do they have? Um, the sanitation department in New York City did a fabulous job, but by and large, you know, government was uh, busy putting out press releases. Uh, if you went to, <clears throat> excuse me, FEMA, if you went to FEMA in, in, the, in the Rockaways, there are a bunch of guys in a tent waiting for people to show up and fill out some forms. Um, you know, neighbors had to help neighbors. Uh, people from, the, from Manhattan had to come out and help. Um, uh, uh, Nonprofit organizations had to set up uh, shelters and, and distribution centers. Um, and it, it, to me, uh, it, it suggests not how much government can do to help it, but how little government does to help. Uh, it's not that different, when you get right down to it, to what happened in New Orleans, where ultimately the Ninth Ward is being rebuilt by Brad Pitt and not the city or the state or the federal government, um, but by the community. So I'm very discouraged, frankly, uh, in the wake of this, and I disagree with Dick that we will come up with a plan and a proposal and this will never happen again. I would say the next time this happens, the exact same thing will happen again. Well, we want to address that. We'll come back to that and expand upon that point as well. I want to talk now about uh, some of the most vivid scenes that we've seen of the destruction that were covered uh, by NJTV, by our Lauren Wonko. She was, in fact, you might recall, on the beach when the storm hit. And she joins us now this evening live from Seaside Heights. Lauren? Good evening, Mike. I'm standing on the brand new boardwalk here in Seaside Heights. Now, there are about 10 blocks that are already completed here, and five more blocks are under construction. Everything is slated to be open by Memorial Day. As for the Jetstar roller coaster, well, on Tuesday, crews began removing that coaster and the three other rides submerged in the Atlantic Ocean. Work on that project is still underway. Now, we initially began our report here in Seaside Heights in the days following the storm. We first began our coverage in Cape May. Local officials there were bracing for a direct hit. The morning after the storm, this is what we found. Check out this street sign here on Beach Avenue. Cape May officials braced for the worst, but the seaside community suffered minimal damage. We traveled farther north and saw unimaginable destruction. That's where we met Ortley Beach resident John Testa. When I came back, my initial thought was I was going to be able to salvage something from the home but there's nothing to salvage. It's a complete and total loss. Six months later, we revisit Testa for a tour of his home. It's as though time stood still. Dishes lined the dishwasher. It was filled just before Sandy barreled in and changed everything. 
The water line is still visible on the walls. It hurts every time you walk in the house. It really does. It hurts. I mean, there's my life in front of me here, which was taken away in the space of minutes. Testa finally received his insurance settlement, but reconstruction is at a standstill. Um, we're all waiting on uh, flood elevation level maps and what we have to do to go through that process and whether it's um, feasible to even do that. On this day, Testa meets with the grassroots nonprofit, Paying It Forward Foundation. A team of volunteers will gut the house free of charge and help rebuild the storm damaged home. This is going to be an all day job. Maybe six months from now, it'll look completely different and we'll be back home. We'll be back home. <laughs> Since we last met with John, volunteers came in and gutted the majority of his home. But Mike, there are still so many homeowners here in need of that same assistance. And on Saturday in Ortley Beach, contractors will begin knocking down homes. About 100 homes are slated for demolition. And construction is underway on sections of their boardwalk. Those portions will be open by June. Here in Seaside Heights, Mayor Bill Aker tells me he thinks about 85% of the businesses in town will be open by Memorial Day. And at this point, folks here are counting on tourists coming down the shore for the summer. Mike? All right, Lauren, thank you very much. So we get the drift once again there. As Lauren reports, there are signs of recovery, like the roller coaster coming out of the sea. But what about the rebuilding of our infrastructure? The Mayor Belmar, Matt Doherty, was one of the first people that we noticed almost immediately after the storm. You were out there saying that boardwalk was going to be rebuilt. You weren't going to wait. You were going to get it done yourself if you had to. Why did you make that decision? Did you, did you lack a sense of trust in government's ability to respond to your government's local government's need? Uh, no, we took a very aggressive approach uh, from day one. Uh, we were the, the only town that had its entire boardwalk destroyed 1.2 miles. And uh, it's part of the character of the town. Belmar's had a boardwalk since 1875. And at the same time, we have about 140 small businesses that rely on tourists to come during the summer. And without the boardwalk, we wouldn't have those tourists. So those, those middle class families that own those small businesses uh, would be devastated. So, you know, we took it upon ourselves to be aggressive about it and set that type of tone that, uh, yeah, October 29th was devastating to our community, but we weren't going to let it devastate us. And, um, you know, we thought that was an important tone to set, particularly for homeowners who, at the same time, were taking their belongings out of their basement and first floor and putting it on the, on the street uh, because now it was all garbage. Um, so we wanted to have a very positive, aggressive attitude right from the start. I want to talk about the infrastructure on Long Island as well. Uh, be talking about the Belmar Boardwalk, places like that where I took my kids when they were little. I grew up on Long Island where the Jones Beach Boardwalk, the boardwalk on, uh, actually on Long Beach, was blown away by the storm. John Cameron is the chair of the uh, Long Island Planning Council. Uh, John, give me a sense of, because I, I've read some of the things you've had to say about the, about the Long Island infrastructure and about how, uh, let's just say, it wasn't attended to as quickly as it could have been, or as soon as it could have been, perhaps. And now it's, it's a question of resources and where you go. Talk to me about infrastructure on the island and the damages done there. There's a, a significant damage to the infrastructure on the island, uh, frankly, and in, in the whole metropolitan area. Uh, the infrastructure, whether it be in the electric power grid, on a water plants, wastewater plants, telecommunications, uh, various critical infrastructure was damaged because, frankly, uh, it was never anticipated that we would encounter a storm like this or surge capacity or surge levels that uh, we encountered with Superstorm Sandy. It's going to take uh, a number of years before we can actually uh, make our uh, infrastructure more resilient so that we can minimize the impact from any future storms or future uh, major uh, uh, events such as, such as this. Uh, there is, there's necessary design that's got to be done. There's got to be significant funding. The funding has been, frankly, was brought up earlier. There's been, it's been slow in coming. The state has tried to move uh, quickly, but with a, uh, a three-month delay in, the, in Congress passing uh, the $60 billion recovery funds, uh, it, it delayed things significantly. So you have a number of municipalities on the island trying to deal with what are the future plans for their infrastructure. They don't have the resources. Coming out of this economic downturn that we've just come out of, or we're hoping to come out of, uh, they did not have the disposable funds to be able to allocate towards in the hardening of the infrastructure. So frankly, they were waiting for some positive nods from FEMA 
from the federal government and from state government that the funds would be available so that they could proceed at least with the design phase and move this forward. Uh, it's been a slow process. Uh, municipalities know that they've got to harden the infrastructure. Some of the critical infrastructure that was necessary just to get the lights back on, that, that, that uh, work was done. But to make our uh, wastewater plants uh, in particular, you, you heard a lot about the wastewater plants uh, during Superstorm Sandy. We discharged billions of gallons of untreated sewage into the metropolitan waters and in and, and the uh, waterways around New York City and Long Island, New Jersey. Uh, the Long, uh, Long, Long Island's largest treatment plant, the Bay Park treatment plant, was down for a number of days, backed up sewage into basements, into the streets, et cetera. The critical infrastructure that's in these plants, whether it be the, uh, the electrical equipment or standby generators, has to be made more resilient. It's got to be elevated. It's got to be protected. Otherwise, these events are still going to are still going to take us out in in the future. And frankly, it's a, a major public health and economic impact to the uh, to the metropolitan area. Now back here in, in New Jersey, in fact, Ralph, your your parent company is about to take over uh, state approval pending the operation of LIPA for its performance or lack thereof during the storm. You got the lights back on for most people six to ten days. Is that a fair assessment? You and I have spoken since then, and, and you come up with a multi-billion dollar plan to harden your infrastructure. Uh, the first thing that people always ask is, why don't you just put it all underground? It's too expensive, you say? Yeah, it's just way too expensive. I mean, it's certainly something that you can consider in certain areas, but if you really go to the end of the line where you're just impacting a few customers, it's about $3 million a mile in this area to, to underground lines. And to do overhead just be, lines, it's about how much? Take those, uh, it's much less. It's in the tens of thousands when you're, in, mm -hmm. the, when you're just rolling out the wire onto some of the existing pole lines. So, you have to take a look at where you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And in that hardening that we're, we've been talking about, we, we do have a plan to underground about 60 miles of lines, but it's going to be at about $3 million. So it's one of the conversations we're going to have with policymakers. Okay, back to Lincoln Center right now. Colonel John Boulay, uh, Vice President Parsons Brinkerhoff. He's the retired colonel and uh, district commander in the New York region for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. When, when you saw the damage done by this storm to this region, was it... Were you surprised by it, or was it something that you knew it was just a matter of time? Well, Mike, I think uh, it was just a matter of time. Uh, you know, you brought, uh, you brought up Katrina before. It's a different situation in Katrina. That was a protected city. A lot of the flooding came because of uh, the uh, system there failed, unfortunately, because of the uh, intensity of Katrina and other reasons. Here, you've got a vulnerable region. Uh, you've got the, you know, the great city of New York. You've got, uh, you know, the, the communities in Long Island and New Jersey. Uh, you, you, you do have some engineered beaches. You have some uh, coastal protection systems that are designed to withstand, you know, smaller storms, tropical storms, but nothing's ever been built to uh, withstand a storm with the uh, power of Sandy. Uh, so really, you know, you talked about what's the headline. And to me, the headline is, what are we going to do to prevent this from happening again? And so when are we going to get on to the rebuilding? And what's that rebuilding going to look like? What are, the, what are the ideas, what are the planning that needs to go into developing a, a series or system of, of of risk reduction interventions in this region to ensure that when the next Sandy-like storm hits, we don't suffer the same level of damages? We I think that's a great question. It is a great question. And in fact, we want to expand upon it a little bit later in the broadcast because uh, we're going to set that up now by talking about what's happened and uh, specifically about the homes. We've seen how many homes were destroyed. We want to talk about rebuilding homes right now because we assume that most people are indeed eager to rebuild and to return to their homes. But it's really not that simple. We have two reports for you right now. My colleague, Rafael P. Roman, will take us to the Rockaways in a moment. But first, Staten Island, where WNYC reporter Jim O'Grady met Stephen Dramalis just a few days after Sandy washed his home, uh, almost washed his home and himself away. Take a look at this. I was walking around the neighborhood, which had the highest concentration in the city of deaths from the storm, wreckage everywhere. I asked Stephen Jamalis to describe what happened the night of the storm. I seen the water coming around the block. I looked like white water, you know. Went like this, grabbed my door, locked it, I jumped off the steps. 
got to my car. By the time I was at my car, it was, the water was up to the bottom of the car. I jumped into the car, started up, throw it in drive, and just took off down the block. He returned the next morning to find that the water had rushed through at a height of eight feet, leaving a line of mud across his walls. Then came months of staying wherever he could. Where my car's parked right now, that's where I slept, right in my car in front of the house. He also stayed with friends and in a motel provided by FEMA, but then National Flood Insurance, a program of FEMA, paid out. Now I tried to get my house fixed as fast as possible. He stripped the house to its studs and replaced everything, electrical, plumbing, sheetrock, floors, and he bought new appliances. It looks great. You got recessed ceiling lights? Yeah, recessed lighting. And you got a classy paint job? Yes, Galveston Gray. There could still be more to do. If Dromalis wants to keep his insurance affordable, he'll have to lift his house above FEMA's new, higher flood line. But he and his neighbors don't yet know how high to go or how much it'll cost. Nobody knows what's going on. And there's another option. He could apply to New York City or state for a buyout and walk away from his home. If I do keep the house and I decide a couple years down the line to sell it, do you think they're going to give mortgages down here? I don't think so. So it might be best to take the buyout. The buyout program, which will not be quick or simple, starts next month at the earliest. That's when Jamalis and his neighbors will have to decide what they value more. Living on a block near the beach where people look out for each other and kids roam from yard to yard, or moving away from a New York City flood zone. I'm Jim O'Grady in Ocean Breeze on Staten Island. A few days after the storm, I came here to Far Rockaway, Queens, and I met Betty Leon. Betty has lived here on this quiet street, just a few blocks from the beach for 25 years. And the night of the storm, water gushed into Betty's home, destroying everything she had in her basement. Everything I owned was down here. Today, her basement is undergoing a transformation. Everything here is new. The whole basement, the whole basement was gutted. She received a check for $27,000 from her flood insurance, but both her claim to her homeowner's insurance and to FEMA were denied. She says that after many calls and a few face-to-face -face meetings, FEMA sent her a check for a little over $1,000. I have not cashed it yet because I'm thinking to go and give it right back to them. Betty says FEMA's policy is that if she accepts FEMA's money, she'll have to commit to keeping flood insurance forever. But since her flood insurance premium has more than doubled since the storm, she isn't sure she'll be able to afford to comply with FEMA's requirement. This issue of flood insurance is going to cause more damage, more devastation in this community than the actual storm did. You're going to have to get flood insurance to buy a home. And if you currently have a mortgage, you're going to have to get flood insurance. Flood elevation maps will detail the level of risk in the different areas and, in turn, the price of flood insurance. Flood insurance will go from $1,000 to $1,500 to anywhere from eight dollars to $15,000. If you raise your home 10 feet, it's still going to be eight or $9,000, but it's going to cost you $100,000 or $150,000 to raise it. Who has that money? No one. Who's going to pay for it? Does the government pay for it? If you don't raise your house, your insurance, instead of $8,000 or $6,000, is going to be $15,000. So do you walk away? Do you lose your home? It will destroy our communities. The dilemma homeowners throughout the peninsula are facing is getting accurate information and then deciding how best to move forward, weighing the options and risks of seaside living. I'm Rafael P. Roman in Far Rockaway. And we do have a Rockaways resident with us this evening at the microphone. Could you tell us your name, please, and give us your question? Sure. My name is Sophia DiVirgilio. I'm from uh, Broad Channel in the Rockaways. And I'm going to just preface my question by saying that I, I understand entirely what uh, Jonathan Gaska was just saying. Um, our communities are being pushed in all directions. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, at least in our case, we have, we're running two homes because we still can't live in our house. Uh, we're facing those actuarial insurance rates. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Um, construction costs, mortgages, rent, the Department of Buildings. You know, what is being done for the middle class people like me? What's being done to keep the character of our, of our communities? Um, we have block grants that preclude people who qualify for SBA loans. We're being forced to take on more debt when, in fact, we have uh, flood insurance. What's the purpose of having flood insurance when we have to fight them tooth and nail? And then 
they don't want to pay, and then you know we have to hire uh, you know um, private or public adjusters. Um, we're fighting FEMA now, trying to figure out what, how high we have to raise our homes. If we're going to raise our homes, what's going to be part of the floodplain? We have to pay back part of uh, our uh, a grant that they gave us for contents of our home through the SBA loan. Why do I have to pay interest on paying back FEMA? Why don't they just take it right off the top of the loan? You know, these are just some basic questions. Some, some basic and troubling questions. Commissioner Constable. It's a, it's the, <laughs> that's why you're here. Mm. This is obviously on the other side of the Hudson River, but it's right. a problem that strikes near and dear to people on the island, in the city, uh, throughout New Jersey. What can you say to her? Well, I mean, one of the things, and, and I started to talk about some of the programs that we're going to be rolling out shortly, and as has been discussed before, New Jersey, New York, we're, we're getting dollars that we're going to give to our residents from the federal government. Because of the, the delay that um, was encountered through Congress, there was a delay in homeowners getting dollars. But the good news is now we have the money, and now we've designed some programs. So one that we have in New Jersey uh, that would be helpful to a similar, similarly situated resident is a $150,000 grant free money that we're going to give to homeowners that have homes that need to be elevated, homes that need to be reconstructed, homes that need to be rehabbed. Um, later this month, in a few weeks, we're going to put, have an application online, and we're, we're obviously encouraging um, all New Jerseyans to uh, apply that are in need. It's going to be a $700 million program. Uh, let's go back to Lincoln Center. Sheena Wright, uh, talk to me. I mean, these, these are heartbreaking stories that we're hearing. I, I assume you're hearing the same thing. What, what's being done, it, 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 to the extent that you can tell us what government is doing and what, as a result, your agencies are trying to do to make up the, uh, or fill the gap. Talk to me about that. I think the point that was just made is that government is, is getting the funds now and has developed programs to get resources to uh, those that need them but it's just coming in now. So in the meantime, uh, the entire social sector, the nonprofit organizations, whether they're housing organizations, Habitat for Humanity, you know, Goodwill Neighbors, uh, other people that are serving people at, at a variety of income levels, have been doing the best that they can in stepping in the gap. I mean, we deployed over 3,000 volunteers across New York City. We've, we, we've raised a fund and we've put out resources into over 200 nonprofits that are directly serving residents across the city. And so nonprofits, United Way of New York City, as well as others, have stepped in in terms of resources and assistance where it's needed, but it's nowhere near enough. All right. Uh, I want to take up the issue of governments buying up properties in flood prone areas. It, it may be good for those homeowners in some cases. The question is, what does the public think about that? Patrick Murray, director of the Monmouth University Polling Institute, is here for us once again. Uh, you and I have spoken a lot over the last couple of years. And we, the, you, I guess the latest numbers that you've had out in terms of the polling numbers on this um, are rather striking in some respects. Tell me about that. Yeah, th this is a bone of contention for, for most people. They uh, support uh, spending state money, uh, federal money, local taxpayer money for a whole host of things, helping businesses and so forth. But when it comes to helping homeowners, there's a real disparity. It's a difference between those who are in urban areas uh, who may have unexpectedly been hit. Help those people. But when we ask about people who live uh, along coastal areas down the shore and so forth, it's no, the, we shouldn't be buying those people out. That we shouldn't be using state money to do that. And uh, the reason being is because, not because they're rich or not because these are second homes or luxury homes, it's because People knew the risk when you bought a house down the shore. If you're living four blocks from the ocean, you know what that risk is, and so you should have enough insurance to take care of it yourself, and if you can't, then the state sh shouldn't step they in. There was a pretty that. sharp dividing line in between, I mean, almost an even split in some cases, 41-50. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, uh, we, when we ask people about support for businesses, support for rebuilding boardwalks, support for infrastructure, support for urban areas, we're talking about 70 percent, 80 percent support. When we get to helping people who live down the shore, it drops down to 40 percent. And even shore homeowners have been telling us that they don't think that they should be bought out either. Interesting. All right. We have another question in the audience. Could you tell us your name, where you're from, and what your question is, please? And a lead green associate mm -hmm. from Oceanport, New Jersey. 
And my question is, with all the rebuilding and funds available, we have a wonderful opportunity to rebuild residential properties that follow green building guidelines. How much emphasis will be given to rebuilding sustainably in regard to the RREM grant program? Mm, that's a good Thank question. Uh, Peter Reinhardt, director of the Kislak Real Estate Institute here at Monmouth University. Well, you want to take a crack at that? Well, we definitely need to build smarter, more resiliently, and, and in ways that will reduce the risk of harm should, God forbid, another superstorm occur. Uh, building greener or, or stronger is definitely the way to go. The state has a program uh, with regard to energy appliances where they actually will provide um, money to buy more energy efficient appliances. So it's definitely the way to go, as particularly if you have to rebuild from scratch. We also have with us Bill Olfelder. He's the executive director of the Nature Conservancy here in New York. Uh, everybody wants to go to green. Nobody expected to have to accelerate the process because of what we've been through. Talk to me about what the uh, guest said. Well, I think one of the lessons of Sandy was that nature and natural defenses are a part of the solution. Um, the Nature Conservancy served on Governor Cuomo's 2100 Resiliency Commission, and it was about how do we protect, how do we rebuild. But the third recommendation was let's use nature, let's use natural defenses, things like dunes, wetlands, oyster reefs, coastal forests, to protect our property and our people. And I think the earlier segment mentioned Cape May, and there was very little destruction in areas of Cape May because there had been a project that the Nature Conservancy You were did involved with the Army Corps in that. With the Army Corps, yeah. the state of New Jersey, and the local communities to rebuild dunes, the beach, and wetlands, and the impacts of Sandy there were incredibly mitigated as a result of those natural defenses. At the beginning of the storm, in fact, we had our Lauren Wanko positioned down there expecting the worst, and we were amazed, very pleasantly surprised and happy for the people down there that this storm seemed to have spared them, and, and now we do know why. Bud Griffiths, the professor of civil engineering and construction, Polytechnic Institute of New York, would you, uh, NYU, would you like to take a crack at this as well? Well, we had a, in 2009, in March, we had a, sem, uh, a seminar to look at protecting New York from storm surges, because we were predicting a major storm hitting, hitting the bite of New York. Uh, and we had a, a number of structural solutions recommended. A number of the uh, and companies that are sponsoring uh, this uh, town hall meeting actually provided concept designs for these things. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there was an entire conference about that. So, uh, so, so there can be structural solutions to protect particularly downtown Manhattan. The Corps of Engineers has, for, for years and years, been building engineered beaches and dunes. You know, dunes act nothing but, but as, a, as, a, as a replenishment resource for the beaches. And that long reach. Uh, as far as using uh, natural forces uh, to protect in New York and the South Shore of Long Island, for instance, and the Jersey Shore, if we'd have started in 1650, it might work. Uh, Right now, it's not going to uh, make any major impact. Uh, kind of discouraging, considering nobody has invented a true wayback machine just yet. Uh, in a storm that was filled with surprises, one of the biggest occurred on the island of Manhattan, where virtually no one expected Sandy to shut down the subways, to knock out the lights, to flood the tunnels, and endanger some of the priciest real estate on the planet. The Metro Focus reporter Rick Carr now takes us inside the infrastructure. Lower Manhattan is still coming to terms with the reminder that the storm sent ashore, that some of the most expensive real estate in the world is vulnerable. The MTA, for example, learned its four-year-old half-billion-dollar South Ferry subway station couldn't survive the flooding, but its century-old predecessor could. When an explosion at Con Ed's east side generating station plunged Lower Manhattan into darkness, the utility learned that its retaining walls had been just a couple of feet too short to keep out the surge. At Verizon headquarters on West Street, engineers learned that salt water and old copper telephone wires don't mix when five feet of water flooded this basement cable vault. The floodwaters knocked out 70 cables that connect the building to thousands of homes and offices around the neighborhood and knocked out the services those cables carry. Voice services, high-speed data services, 
movement of information, video signals. Verizon's Chris Lavenda says the telecom company gleaned some good news from the flood. While the storm played havoc with those old copper cables, it had no effect on modern fiber optic lines. So Verizon stepped up its efforts to replace the copper cable. Having a fiber optic based uh, medium to distribute services in this area underground is the best way to be able to deal with flooding. New York City grew up where it did because the Hudson and East Rivers, New York Bay and the Atlantic Ocean are nearby. So as long as the city is going to have that relationship to the waters that surround it, it's going to have to deal with whatever those waters wash ashore. I'm Rick Carr in Lower Manhattan. So apparently there was something of a silver lining in those copper wires. What else do we need to know about strengthening our infrastructure? Uh, Brent N. sent us a question on Twitter. He asks, have our experts learned anything from Sandy? And what precautions have been implemented before the next storm season? And I may be the first to break this to you this evening. Hurricane season begins in a couple of weeks. Back to New York right now. Richard Ravitch, uh, you know a lot about real estate and commercial development in Manhattan. Well, what have we learned and what have we done? We've learned that the most important thing, as I said earlier, is to uh, make sure that we have the ability to restore power uh, or to prevent power from uh, from being shut off as a result of the flooding. This means elevating a whole series of complicated transformers and switchgear and existing buildings and existing street locations. Uh, uh, the reason the subways uh, came back relatively quickly was because Tom Prendergast, who ran the, the Transit Authority, understood that you removed from the subway tunnels the the, the the technological gear that was vulnerable to the corrosion of salt water, and that was removed before and reinstalled a few days later, which is why the subway system uh, came back into shape. So it's, it's, it depends, of course, on the location, on the nature of the real estate. Uh, none of this is beyond our capacity to analyze, and that is being done. It's being done in part by the industry itself. The engineers and the contractors and the architects are developing their set of very specific recommendations, which they're sharing with both the task force that was set up in Washington, run by Sean Donovan, as well as the inf sharing this information ultimately with the governor and the mayor uh, of the city. And I'm sure comparable people are doing the same thing in New Jersey. So. We, we do have the capacity uh, from a technical point of view to mitigate the damage. We don't have the ability to prevent flooding uh, in its entirety. Uh, it's ultimately going to be a question of money. I'm confident, despite what Joe says, that government will have in place that which they should have had in place before Sandy, particularly as a result of the experience that we uh, had with Irene, but they will have in place uh, uh, a system to, to mitigate the results uh, of this kind of natural disaster. Uh, speaking of the subways, I understand there were reports today that they actually were experimenting in an unused subway tube today, and the MTA was with a, some sort of giant inflatable plug that would fill up one of the tubes and prevent water from getting in and doing all the destruction that it did. Uh, when Sandy hit Lower Manhattan, uh, Ralph Larosa, PSE and G, back to you on this on this subject. You were quoted as saying, and you actually weren't quoted as saying. You said it to me <laughs> that you were surprised that the storm surge was what it was, and that really, to uh, I guess a great extent, did more damage than you really could have anticipated any other way. So. What do, you, what do you do with that knowledge now? Well, I think we just heard, you know, what we need to do is we need to raise the infrastructure, especially in those substations and switching stations that are around Newark Bay. Um, just like as it impacted the South Shore of Long Island, that storm surge came in and we saw levels that no one had predicted we would see. I mean, the Raritan River, 13, 14 feet crest levels. So we need to raise all of those switching stations and substations because moving them in this environment just isn't practical at this point. Well, let me ask you something, because today there was a report that the, uh, the weather folks, the National 
Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that uh, there was a report on their forecast, which said they were very, very accurate, good forecast, but that it was confusing to a lot of the people, the media, well, we, get e we get easily confused sometimes, but that it was confusing to the media and to others who have to respond to forecasts like that. Were, was PSE and G confused at all by the forecast? Well, I wouldn't say we were confused. I think what happened was they were talking about three to five feet of storm surge, and then there was the title on top of that. So there was some confusion to a degree there, but the areas that were flooded, I, we could not have put up large enough walls to have protected it. So because it wouldn't of the mass, If exactly, you knew it was coming, you couldn't have done it. The anything. massive area that, that had to be protected, there was no way, even if we had known a week in advance, that we would have been able to do that. Okay, back to Lincoln Center right now. Bud Griffiths, once again, professor of civil engineering, construction, Polytechnic Institute of, of NYU. Uh, why don't you take a, a crack at this, this infrastructure? What have we learned and what can we do? And, and apparently, I mean, you know, there's nothing, some of these things just can't be fixed overnight. Well, when you're, when you're facing uh, the kind of costs that it would take to make a structural, a structural protection barrier for New York City, you can afford to do some other things that may not be quite so costly. And, and our infrastructure agencies have been. Con Ed, for instance, after the 1992 Nor'easter, uh, has required that uh, uh, the transformers and, and uh, network, uh, uh, network equipment be submersible. So rather than raise them, they make it so they can be flooded. And that's it's in all new structures, but it hadn't in the old ones. So, so our, our agencies are, are doing really well. The, the subway, uh, right now the Transit Authority is looking at building a, a three-sided box at all subway entrances that can have a fourth side slipped in in the, in the uh, case of a major disaster, looking at bubbles to put over the grating. So, th so these things are all being done, and I think... Uh, Probably uh, our solution is going to be uh, really less less flood proof. These I'm even thinking about doing that in my house on Long Island. Uh, see if I can't make it flood proof. When it, next time it next time we have a another 500 year storm and maybe this year, <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about leaving the garage door open. So. <laughs> you might not be alone. Uh, I want to stay in New York right now with John Cameron back. Uh, he's the chair. Long Island Regional Planning Council. John, once again, I'm referring to my boyhood days. The south shore of the island has been flooding for years in storms far less severe than Sandy, of course. You talked about some of the infrastructure issues before. You talked about some of the sewage treatment areas and things like that. You do have PSE, uh, G parent company coming in to take over from LIPA if the New York legislature uh, agrees with that move. So you could have infrastructure changes as well there. But I mean, do you have even a dollar figure in your mind what it would cost to do that and where that money would come from? Frankly, with all the, uh, all the, I guess, the hype and the publicity over the $60 billion, it sounds like a tremendous amount of money, which it really is. But I think if you talk to the engineering construction community and even the, a lot of municipal officials, you know, it's not enough money to go around to really harden our infrastructure to protect against future events such as the Superstorm Sandy. So we need to prioritize. We need to look to utilize our money cost effectively. We can't elevate all our, our, our critical infrastructure. But that which we can't, we're going to look to have to harden in more cost-effective ways. The dollars are just phenomenal, and uh, we're really not going to get there, I think, in, in the immediate future. So we, we need to prioritize the most critical infrastructure, in particular, again, on the electric grid, and as well as your water and wastewater systems, uh, that which can really impact the public health and, and our, our, our quality of life here, here in the metropolitan area. Staying at Lincoln Center once again, Colonel Boulay, let me go back to you right now, because you know from your Army Corps experience and now in your advisory capacity with Parsons uh, Brinkerhoff, what can you, I mean, you take a look at, at uh, what Bud just said about these 500 year storms now seemingly coming every year. How can you plan for that? How can you advise for that? How can you counsel for that? What do we do about that? Well, I mean, I mean first of all, we've got to realize that it's the new reality, uh, Mike. And, uh, you know, climate change is real. It's, it's more than sea level rise that's going to happen over the course of the next 100 years. It's greater storm intensities. It's greater storm frequencies, and we've got to stop ignoring it and, and start uh, planning and uh, building to, uh, to reduce the risk to the public. Uh, that, that's, that's where we are. And 
you know, we talked about Long Island. Uh, we talked about uh, core projects. Uh, there, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of activity in New Jersey right now. The core is putting lots of sand on the beaches now to sort of uh, restore uh, to, to the design specifications some of the engineered beaches that are there because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, hurricane season is, is upon us again. So we, you know, I think agencies like the Corps in New Jersey, and, and they're going to be doing the same thing, by the way, on the Rockaways. They're going to be doing it on Coney Island. Uh, the Corps is going to finish a, a, a study on Staten Island and, uh, and then hopefully start building uh, 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 risk reduction uh, intervention strategies there on the South Shore. We've got, to we've got to have action, and we've got to have action that's consistent with the future that, that uh, consists of, of more intense storms that happen more frequently. Um, and, and so really that starts with developing a plan. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're seeing that. We're seeing that in, uh, in New York City, and, and uh, you know, hats off to the Bloomberg administration. Uh, he's formed uh, his own special initiative for uh, rebuilding and resiliency. And I think, you know, in, in a few weeks when the mayor uh, releases his plan, you're going to see some thoughtful analysis that goes into good ideas uh, for consideration uh, to help lower the risk to the public. Um, so it's, I'm not going to steal the, the mayor's thunder, that's for sure. But it, it's planning. It's, you know, we have a blank sheet of paper now. Let's get down and start with a with some real ideas that are well thought out, and then let's, let's get into implementation of those. And at the same time, let's build up our, our defenses, as I suggested that is happening now in places like Long Island and, and, and New Jersey and, and hopefully shortly in Staten Island in the next couple of years until we can get these plans um, authorized and get the additional federal funding. Yes, it is going to be uh, new money. Uh, let, let's, uh, let, let's, get, let's get to work. All right, Colonel. Thank you very much. I'm going to pause right now and go to a question that we recorded a bit earlier in New York. Watch this. I'm Gustavo Suarez. I live uh, in the financial district. I was displaced by Hurricane Sandy. And I'm just wondering when is the next one coming? All right. Vivian Cornett, special research scientist at Columbia University. You have the honor of telling us when the next one is coming. Well, I can't give a date. But I can say that there probably will be such a storm in the future. And what with rising sea levels, uh, even a storm of uh, a lesser magnitude would uh, create a flood uh, level uh, equivalent to that of Sandy. So even though Sandy was a very rare and freak event, um, the type of damage caused by such storms is likely to increase because of climate change. You've done, you've done work specifically aimed at it considering what could happen in New York City? Well, that's true. As part of a team uh, that was working for the city, in fact, we are uh, uh, preparing a report right now for the city, the uh, New York City Panel on Climate Change. And, and that report should be out within a couple, a week or two, and will be available to the public. It will be online. And Bill Elfelder, back to you for a second on this, this issue. I mean. I assume 30 years ago, the Conservancy had a certain agenda, certain issues, certain things to think about. Was this one of them? Well, it is. It's interesting. We, the Nature Conservancy, recognizing that the world is increasingly urbanizing, was focusing on New York City. And right now, New York and the New York region is one of the five most vulnerable metro areas in the United States to natural disasters like Hurricane Sandy. And so we've become very focused on what's the role of of science and predict, you know, when you see something like this coming, we have a tool called uh, Coastal Resilience, which is online, coastalresilience.org, and it shows you can model different storms, different tidal circumstances, and see what's going to happen and how do you plan for that better. And I think, again, this point is there's no easy way out, and that's what we're hearing from everybody. They're going to be uh, hard infrastructure built solutions. They're going to be creative things like balloons and subway tunnels, but they're also going to be things like dunes and marshes and you know we need to look at a full suite of those possibilities and have the right mix and the nature conservancy is about how do we find that mix and how do we make sure nature plays that role for all of us mayor doherty i'm hearing a lot of need to's gonna have to should uh, you got a community down there they got hit hard 
You've got hurricane season starting in a couple of weeks. What are you doing? Well, um, one of the things the Army Corps of Engineers is doing is a beach replenishment uh, for our community and other communities at the Jersey Shore. One of the very frustrating things for me and the other residents in our town was that we were on a list for beach replenishment from the Army Corps of Engineers prior to Hurricane Sandy, but it was never funded by Congress. And the question I ask, what we have to ask is, had that beach replenishment done, been done in time for Sandy, would it have mitigated some of the, the, the hazard uh, and the damage that our town suffered in the rest of the Jersey Shore as well. Hey John Belay back in Lincoln Center. You want to you take a crack at this one? Sure. Uh, I, I'd be happy to, Mike. I mean, it's a great question uh, that the mayor has. And the reality is there just hasn't been the support in Congress for beach replenishment or beach restoration projects because the public thinks these things are recreational projects. Um, but the reality is that beaches and dunes and, and wetlands, uh, they provide storm protection. And um, I th I'm hoping that Sandy uh, will, will, you know, sensitize the public to understanding that, that these engineered beaches and these dunes and these natural resilience type features are, are, are good. And the recreational benefits are ancillary, they're auxiliary. What these uh, engineered projects are designed to do is protect infrastructure, to protect facilities, to keep people's houses uh, safer or reduce the risk of damage uh, to those that are living near the coast. So, I, I, you know, there are lots of projects going on now, and, and I think it makes good sense, and those communities that had these kind of projects in front of them uh, would certainly agree that we need uh, more of them. On that note, I want to go back to Mayor Zimmer right now. Right after the storm hit, you were talking seawalls, wanted seawalls. I want to know where that stands right now, but I also want to know about the new proposal you have to spend millions of dollars on a new pump to pump out your town when the water gets too high. Well, basically what I did, you know, after the storm brought in a lot of uh, stakeholders and um, Stevens was, Institute was part of that and, and had a discussion about what, you know, where should we go, what should we look at, and we put together um, what we believe to be a comprehensive plan and what we're trying to do is combine both engineering solutions and green solutions as well. So the pumps are something that we absolutely need as that emergency measure. We have one pump and it's made a huge difference. At the press conference that I did yesterday, we had a business owner who four to five times a year was flooded out after that pump was installed. She was never flooded again except for, of course, Sandy. But it really has made a difference. In the meantime, we are trying to, we're in the process of buying land on the western side of the city where we totally flooded. We want to build, um, you know, a, a detention, possibly look at the feasibility of detention basins underneath. And then we're also looking at the possibility of really tapping into the natural topography of Hoboken. The water came in on the south and the north, and if we could protect the entire city, then we can, uh, you know, by putting a, a flood breaks, uh, walls, building it into the development. We could protect the entire city, protect the character of the city, because the reality is in, in an urban area, we can't lift our homes up on pilings. Um, and so that's, there's twofold reasons that we want, that I'm interested in these walls. One is to obviously protect our residents, protect our businesses, but also to protect us from the National Flood Insurance Program. If we can demonstrate to the federal government that we really are protecting our city, then we will get out of the National Flood Insurance Program. Mayor Zimmer, we have to pause there right now because it's been an extraordinary hour that's passed already. We talked about what the storm did, what's been done to try to overcome the damages, what has worked, what has not worked. There's so much more to consider over the course of this next hour or so and so much more to consider as we look for social policies, government policies, and ways to consider exactly what the public perception is of what's been done and, of course, what needs to be done. There is a, there's a lot of talk that's been going on uh, for a long time uh, in the last six months about what various different institutions are capable of doing. And uh, as we've established over the course of this last hour, we've certainly seen how uh, the citizens of uh, this region can rise to the occasion and do an extraordinary job. But as we established at the beginning as well, there's a lot of suffering that's still going on. And it's going on in New Jersey, and it's going on along the shore, and it's going on in the coastal areas of Long Island, and it's going on in the hills and the highlands of New Jersey as well, and for the people in the Rockaways as well, and the people in Long Beach, and, and uh, all throughout the area. Uh, this, this is a situation that certainly is uh, 
cannot be measured necessarily just in dollars and in cents, but in institutional reactions to what has actually happened as well. Uh, we are very, very glad that you could join us for the first hour uh, of what uh, has been, I think, a very interesting revelation about what's happened to our area, what the people here are capable of doing, and what we have to do next as a community. Superstorm Sandy, a live town hall. October 29, 2012, Hurricane Sandy slowed down, turned toward the shore, and struck. Within hours, no power for tens of millions. Everybody waiting for electricity. Hell, we ain't got no light. No gasoline. Seaside Heights is completely flooded. Homes and businesses gone. You can't appreciate this until you're on the ground. Massive fires, transportation halted, hospitals evacuated, the shoreline washed away. That was Superstorm Sandy. Tonight, from New York and New Jersey Public Television Stations 13, WLIW and NJTV, WHYY-TV Philadelphia, WNYC 93.9 FM and AM820, New Jersey Public Radio, The Star Ledger and NJ.com, NJ Spotlight, NJ News Commons, and The New York Times. This program is made possible by the New Jersey Recovery Fund at the Community Foundation of New Jersey, the General Contractors Association of New York, New York Building Congress and New York Building Foundation, Bernard and Irene Schwartz, New Jersey Manufacturers, Parsons Brinkerhoff, Tishman and Acom Company, STV and the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York. And now, live from Monmouth University, here is Mike Schneider. All right, we do welcome you back now to the second hour of our live town hall. Our guests here at the Pollock Theater and at the Tisch WNET Studios in New York continue to be with us. We continue our conversation about Superstorm Sandy, what worked, what didn't, and what's next. One of the great challenges facing us now is convincing a lot of people that a recovery is well underway. In a moment, we will take you to Long Beach, Long Island, where my colleague Jim Paymar will show us that they are hard at work replacing that century-old boardwalk that was washed away. The boardwalks are being rebuilt down the shore here in Jersey as well. But getting beachgoers to sign on for the summer season, in some cases, is easier said than done, as we hear from Brian Donahue of the Star-Ledger. In any other year, this bayfront vacation rental in South Mantaloking would have been booked for the summer by January. This year, as the calendar turns to May, no one has taken it. Realtor Jeffrey Childers says, blame Hurricane Sandy. We do have available homes that are unharmed, for instance, this one that we're in now, uh, but we're just not getting the demand of people coming down and wanting to rent. The house, which was not damaged at all in the storm, is typical of a summer rental market that is still floundering in the wake of the hurricane. Even areas that saw little or no damage are being shunned by tourists who are wary of spending time at the shore this summer. But Sandy did not treat all towns equally. Farther south in Lavalette, where damage was far less, the boardwalk is rebuilt, businesses are reopening, and there's signs that the summer might be almost normal. And in Midway Beach in South Seaside Park, the rows of bungalows sit untouched by Hurricane Sandy, but many still unrented by vacationers. Lease signings are off 30 to 40 percent from a typical year. Usually we get a spike mid-March of people that, that sign leases, call ahead. Um, this year we didn't have it. We are anticipating that hopefully that will happen in June once a lot of the boardwalk is completed and people are to school. They kind of come and see that it's done. For those who do come this summer, there's a chance they might have to put up with some inconveniences. But if they're willing to gamble and they choose the right spot, there could be the payoff of a great Jersey Shore summer, great beaches, and far fewer crowds than usual. In South Seaside Park, I'm Brian Donahue. The city of Long Beach took a direct hit from Sandy, not only from the Atlantic Ocean to the south, but from the bay to the north. The damages were astronomical, and it will be many years before this city fully recovers. It was as wicked a storm as anyone in Long Beach can remember. 
When it was over, Sandy devastated the city of Long Beach, causing over $200 million in damage to infrastructure alone and affecting in some way nearly all of its 9,500 homes. The water was rushing through the doorways. Suzanne LaManna lost everything on the first floor of her bayfront home. Six months later, Suzanne is still a refugee from her home, living out of suitcases, mostly in FEMA-subsidized hotels. She estimates it will cost $350,000 to rebuild. We were underinsured, so we do not, we will not have enough money to replace everything that we lost. Suzanne's just one of 900 homes substantially damaged. So far, half those homeowners are raising their homes another level to protect them from the next big storm and to secure lower flood insurance rates. All the utilities will be lifted three foot above the base flood elevation. Anything that could get damaged at all is lifted. And to further protect the neighborhoods, a federally funded $150 million project soon to begin to build 16 foot high dunes along the length of the Long Beach shoreline. All that remains of the famous Long Beach Boardwalk are concrete foundations built more than a century ago. The 2.2 mile long boardwalk is being rebuilt. The $44 million project will be completed by November with some sections open by Memorial Day. This forevermore will be looked at as the summer when the boardwalk sprang up uh, before our very eyes. It will likely be years before the city by the sea totally recovers from the ravages of Sandy. But people are optimistic. Long Beachers have a saying about the revival until the last person comes home. In Long Beach, I'm Jim Paymar reporting. All right, back once again, we have a question about the shore. Could you tell us your name, please, and your question, if you would? Yes, my name is Sheila Hatami, and I'm an attorney living and working here in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Uh, my question is twofold. First, is there projected to be a return to commercial versus residential development along the Jersey Shore? And second, have commercial and business entities been more or less successful than homeowners in recovering from the damage overall? I think that's a question for the commissioner. Richard Constable, Commissioner, New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Why do I get all the hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> And if we talk about businesses along the shore, that's obviously a concern. They um, had damage to their infrastructure, damage to their um, goods, and they had to lay off a number of folks. Why the governor wanted to make sure that the shore was ready and open by Memorial Day is to make sure that these businesses don't suffer. And while there was definitely a lot of damage, the good news is a lot of businesses have rebuilt. A lot of homes, sorry, a lot of businesses weren't damaged, and we want to, uh, you know, encourage and get folks there. I'd mentioned before briefly um, that for homeowners, there's going to be an application process that's going to start up in the next few weeks. For businesses, that's already been opened and, and started up, uh, run by the uh, New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Nicole Jelinas, we have not had a chance to hear from you in this conversation. Uh, there are a lot of people who question government's role. We talked a little bit about this earlier with Joe Nocera. He, I think he was more critical of government's performance as opposed to necessarily its role, although we'll talk to him about that shortly as well. But, but Ms. Gelinas, you have questions about, about government's appropriateness of being interjected into finding solutions here, do you not? Yes, in the infrastructure area, there are two headlines here. The first is that disasters reveal, they don't transform. Government institutions that were doing well before Sandy continue to do well after Sandy. One good example is the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, which runs New York City subways, buses, as well as the commuter rails. They did very well after the storm in getting emergency bus service up and then getting the subway service up within a few days. That was not a surprise because they have been under much better management than they once were for years now. On the other side, you have the Long Island Power Authority, quasi-government institution, has been doing very poorly on a day-to-day -day basis for years and years, really decades since Governor Cuomo's father was in office, so it was not a surprise that they also fell down during and after Sandy. These are places where the government has to have a role. 
Occupy Sandy cannot go into the subways and get the subways up and running. On the other hand, Occupy Sandy can help a person pull the drywall out of their home and rebuild and repaint. So are, you, are you encouraged by the fact that you, you mentioned LIPA? That LIPA apparently would be nothing more than a holding company if the governor has his way, and that PSEG will take over operations of private entity. Well, that gets me to the other headline, which is in the long term, who pays and what do they pay for? There is a, a false obsession with federal money and the idea that the federal government is going to somehow pay for all of this. And the utility arena is a good example. Governor Cuomo on Long Island has said he wants to put $2 billion toward better electrical infrastructure. The reality, though, is that these projects are so expensive and they are done over so many years and decades, really, that if people on Long Island want a more reliable power grid, they are going to have to pay for it. The utility is going to have to invest in more substation, underground lines where there's enough population density to justify the cost, and people will pay for that on their power bills, as they should. Electricity customers pay for the service that they get. This doesn't change that equation. Mass transit, on the other hand, is always a subsidized, a, a business subsidized by the government. This doesn't change that equation either. It's in the area of rebuilding individual homes as well as the flood insurance program where there's a real problem with the government's role here. The single biggest part of the $60 billion disaster aid law is helping people to rebuild their homes, whether through flood insurance or through these extra FEMA grants. And there's a real question of fairness, as uh, Nate from Occupy Sandy brought up, as well as a couple of other people. Should people who live inland in a smaller home, in many cases in the city, be paying to subsidize people who choose to bear the risk of living on the coast? And then in turn, should the government encourage them to rebuild where they're keeping themselves and their families in danger? They're helping coastal erosion and they're stressing out government emergency services in a storm. Okay, but I want to go to Long Island in a second, but Ralph, we were talking PSEG, your parent company there, and I, corner of my eye, caught some, a couple of gestures that I thought indicated you might have something to say here. Well, I, I just thought that was, it was very well said. I mean, there's, there's decisions that have to be made about how the infrastructure is going to be rebuilt. Our role on Long Island is very different. There will be a different uh, mechanism for the capital investment. Um, but that's the, that's the challenge that we have here in New Jersey. Do we want to rebuild and to what standard and how will we pay? Okay. Another question in the audience, if you would. Your name and uh, your question, please. Sure. Pa thank you. Paulina Grabchak from protectingamerica.org. Events like Sandy seem to... I'm sorry. Events like Sandy have shown us that natural catastrophes seem to be happening more and more in our nation. My question is, what is your opinion on the private reinsurance market's ability to handle these unfortunate events? Uh, Peter Reinhardt, you want to take a crack at that? Sure. Uh, you know, insurance is just really an issue of, of risk transfer. Um, how much a homeowner is going to absorb, that's reflected in the size of your deductible, and what's the size of the insurance base. So my understanding is other than the flood insurance, which is a federal program, the, the private insurance companies did not take that big a hit from Sandy because they were probably properly priced and many of the losses were not covered. I think one of the uh, un unsettling lessons learned about this is we don't, a lot of people don't know enough about insurance. They assume they had the right coverage and yet they didn't. So I think uh, the lessons learned are that you need to consult with somebody or, or educate yourself about the proper roles of insurance, what types there are, and then go out and get it and assume you know, what, what you can afford and how much your deductible is going to be, how much you're going to raise your, your home up to reduce those flood insurance premiums that we've heard about and those kinds of things. Uh, back, back to New York right now, Lincoln Center. Joe Nocera, op-ed columnist at the New York Times. It, it, since this storm struck, I mean, we've been consumed with talk about FEMA, about the flood maps, about the flood insurance policies as well. Uh, can you give me any clarity in, in your opinion about how effective these programs and policies are in terms of protecting people who need help in times of need or whether they should be modified or done away with, as some people say. Well, I've waited an hour for another chance to talk, so I'm going to answer a different question first. <laughs> Nature is going to win, ultimately. You can talk all you want about rebuilding. You can put all the money in that you want. You can put houses on lifts. You can change insurance. Nature is going to win. If climate change causes us to have a super storm like Sandy every year 
or every two years, we are not going to be able to continue to talk about rebuilding uh, uh, constantly, changing insurance plans. We're going to have to find a different way to come at this. And we're going to have to think about more radical things, like should you rebuild in a certain place? Should Lower Manhattan remain what it is? Should we put up different kind of barriers? These are, these are more difficult questions. And one of the words that has not been used so far tonight is the word politics. And so I hear a lot of talk about how, how Governor Cuomo is working on this thing, and Mayor Bloomberg is working on that thing, and the studies are coming, and plans are proposal. We're going to wind up having to have our politicians and our body politic and our Congress united on an idea of how to deal with the changes that are taking place in our climate. And one of the things that I find frustrating about this discussion and, and generally about dealing with the aftermath of this storm um, is that we are very, very divided about how to do this and what should be done and whether people should be allowed to rebuild and, 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 and how we should deal with our coastal communities. Um, so I just want to put that on the table as something we ought to be thinking about and something we ought to be talking about tonight. But let me, let me just... And I know that's not an no, answer. No, no, no. That's the, you, got, you got a round of applause here. You got, you got a round of applause here in New Jersey. I'm not sure if they were applauding you in New York, but I want to stay with you for a second because are we, are, are we waiting for consensus or, or are we, you know, we, we're living in an age, Joe, you know, where nobody seems to agree uh, about anything anymore. There's a sharp divide on almost every single issue uh, amongst the parties themselves. Uh, so so uh, what are you saying exactly here? Do we, have to, do, we, do we have to find some magical leader who's capable of coming up with a, a consensus building plan? Because it doesn't seem we're living in a time where consensus seems to dominate our political dialogue at all. Well, I, I agree with you about that. Uh, you know, the, the fact that Congress can't pass anything uh, is extremely frustrating, uh, as we've heard already tonight. But ultimately, I think what we're waiting for, really, is to find out whether, in fact, these storms are going to happen every year. Because we're not used to the idea yet that the world has changed, that nature has actually changed, um, that glaciers are met, all, the, all the things that the, uh, the, 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 that's happening with climate change, we're living through it. We're not ready to acknowledge yet, I don't think, that this is, a re this is going to be a regular part of our lives. And that's going to cost tons of money, and it's going, to, it's going to require a different kind of thinking. So it's not one leader, per se. It's, it's a kind of willingness to submit to the world that we now live in, is how I would think about it. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Patrick Murray, I mean, you are in touch as much as anybody around with the public's feelings, the public's opinions. Your polling is showing you what? Well, this storm really hit, I think, New Jersey in a way, psychologically, that it didn't hit uh, the other states that were impacted by this. Because when the Jersey Shore was hit, it was an impact felt by people who did not live down the Jersey Shore because it's such a part of our psychological makeup. When we've asked people in polls, what's one of New Jersey's best assets? The Jersey Shore always comes at the and, top and of the list. And you polled on, this, on the question of urgency right. of rebuilding and So this. we ask, you know, should you rebuild the shore? And uh, yeah, people say, we need to do that uh, there, because it's the psychological impact of the needing the shore. And there's also the economic impact that everybody's been talking about here that's so important. It's such a driver of who we are as a state and, and how we think of our, if the shore is, is doing well, the New Jersey is doing well. And we've seen in our polling that record numbers say that they're going to go down to the shore for a day trip, at least. Like a uh, show so of support? They're going to show of support. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is for the economy, are they going to stay longer? Are people mm -hmm. out of the state going to come in for those long trips like they have done in the past? Are they going to return? And that's going to be the good big question is whether the, the, the new tourism campaign that the state is starting is going to bring those people in. From, right, because we established early in the broadcast that uh, in some cases the realtors who are trying to rent out the seasonal stuff at the shore are not doing necessarily all that well in all these towns. And it's perception versus reality in, in many cases. Uh, another question from the audience. Your name, please, and your question. Sure. My name is Heather Safford, and I'm a scientist with Clean Ocean Action. That's based in New Jersey. Um, I'm very glad that this discussion is happening tonight. 
sea level rise is predicted to increase by 1.4 feet by 2050 and by 3 to 3.4 feet by 2100. We've also seen an increase in intense storms over recent years. And so my question is, how will sea level rise and extreme weather events like Superstorm Sandy be taken into consideration in resiliency planning and rebuilding efforts? Thank you. Uh, back to uh, New York right now, Colonel uh, John Boulay, uh, formerly with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, in your planning, could you envision the kind of changes that we're seeing apparently occurring on a regular basis now, coping with, with a rising sea level that will mean that every time there is a storm that comes in with a higher sea level, that the, uh, there'll be an exponential increase in the impact that's going to have on our shoreline? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And uh, the answer is you have to. I mean, you can't plan for today. You have to plan for some point in the future. And um, when you do that, you've got to consider um, the data that's before you and make some assumptions. Uh, the young lady from Clean Ocean Action, you know, threw out some numbers on uh, sea level rise. So if, you, if you're going to put, if you're going to build a, a dune, for instance, um, you may build that dune to 15 feet for today's conditions, but you know, the smarter planner will look at what she said and, and, and you know, it's going to be two feet, the sea's going to be two feet higher in 2050, so we ought to build that sand dune to 17 feet. So, so these, these kind of, uh, you know, questions are, are, can be handled by the engineering uh, industry and, and are being handled. And, and there's government policies. For instance, when the Corps does uh, planning, they have to consider climate change and sea level rise uh, in their planning process. Um, so th that's happening, and, and it's happening uh, because it should be happening. Uh, so I, 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 these are not technologically challenging solutions, but we just have to, we have to be prudent and we have to be forward thinking. Uh, we can't, we can't, uh, we've got to slow down a little bit now so that uh, we can come up, come up with the right solutions is what I'm saying. I guess slowing down is okay, unless you're living in a city that could be in harm's way in a couple of weeks when hurricane season comes back again. I mean, talk to me about when you hear the projections about sea level rise, you can put in your second pump, you can put in your retention uh, drain pit or whatever. Will Hoboken be able to live under those conditions with those kind of rising sea levels? Well, what, we're, what I'm advocating for is really we need layers of protection. I mean, it starts with I mean, in the immediacy of, you know, it starts with the community working together, which we had over 5,000 volunteers coming out and residents themselves getting prepared for every single storm. So that's what we're working at on as we approach the, uh, the hurricane season. Um, but then it's, you know, it's, it's looking at the building codes and, and uh, you know, I'm advocating working with the state on like, how can we make it so that, for example, elevators, um, all of the mechanicals for elevators are up on the, the, the top so that there's no way that it will get flooded, that everything is wired into the, the fire suppression system is wired into the elevators and mm -hmm. the hallway lights are lit. Like there's things that we can be doing to reduce the damage. I mean, the elevators, for example, is something that's very expensive. Reduce the damage to those, that kind of infrastructure. Um, so there's, it's layers of protection and that's what we're working towards in Hoboken. And I'm, you know, I, I believe we can do it, but obviously working you know, with the, we're trying to get into the Army Corps study and, and we're working with Stevens Institute and these are all things that, that are going to continue to have to be evaluated, but the pump is something that can definitely help us. Vivian right Gornis, this, this is your specialty. You couldn't tell us before what time and date the next big storm will arrive, but perhaps you can tell us about sea level, how quickly it's rising. And also, you know, I've heard talk that it rises, it's going to rise differently in different locations. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, uh, at least in the New York City area, it, it's been rising about a foot in the last century, and, and this will, we, we um, anticipate that it might rise two or three feet by mid-century and maybe a bit more, another foot or so uh, by the end of the century. Two or three feet by, by 40 years from now? Well, 50, well, 50 years uh, from now. And what, is it, what is that? Well, that, that may be, that's just one estimate. Mm -hmm. and, is that uh, like a mid-range estimate, low estimate, yes, high? Yes, it's sort of a, a mid-range mid to high What's the worst estimate. case scenario? 
Oh, you don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, I don't think we do. I don't think we do. But when you, when you get that, then you get the possibility of, not the possibility, but anything that rolls in on top of that becomes substantially more damaging potentially. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing. Even with a small amount of sea level rise, you could have um, a flood that, that is much more damaging. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> yeah. we want to talk about dunes right now. Over the last six months, sand dunes have gone from being a, uh, I guess you'd have to call them a topographical feature, to becoming a huge political issue. There is no denying that they were effective during Superstorm Sandy, but there is currently a sharp divide over who has the right to decide where the new dunes will go. We get the story now from WHYY's Carolyn Beeler. Superstorm Sandy caused a mind-boggling $30 billion of damage in New Jersey. 365,000 homes were destroyed or significantly damaged. Ted and Dorothy Jedzniak's Ship Bottom Home survived. Their homemade dune held. For 45 years, we planted, we put up fencing, and we nurtured, we respect the dunes. It is necessary. But they don't want the Army Corps of Engineers coming onto their land to build part of a uniform shorewide dune system. The Army Corps of Engineers has had plans to build dunes on nearly the entire developed shore from Sandy Hook to Cape May since 2006. But today, the shore is still a patchwork of completed and uncompleted projects. That's partly because of the reservations of homeowners like the Jedzniaks. Ship Bottom's Joe Esmerado is calling neighbors himself to encourage them to sign. Instead of talking to them, let, let's, let's see if we can't make contact and listen to them to find out why they haven't signed. We don't want development on the top of that dune. We don't want to walk away, benches, or any of that. In response to these concerns, Ship Bottom added a no-build clause to their easement. But the Jedzniaks are still skeptical that promises might not be kept under new administrations. And Esmerado worries about what will happen to Ship Bottom if all the easements there aren't signed. We'll be left in the middle. And, and, and we, we will get the wrath of the storm much worse than, than the town north, north and south of us. This same conflict is happening in many towns on the shore. About 50 miles to the north in Bayhead, residents are taking a different tact. Right after the hurricane, most of us had lost uh, the bulk of our dunes, and we realized that we were pretty vulnerable. So uh, we decided that the easiest thing to do, the quickest thing to do, would be to build a, uh, a rock wall. Oceanfront homeowner Thatcher Brown convinced 13 of his neighbors in Bayhead to pay for a rock revetment and dune themselves at an average cost of almost $200,000 a home. Rock revetments face criticism because they can hasten beach erosion, but Brown says his community needed the quick protection. We had to do it while we still had homes. Rising sea levels uh, with global warming, uh, with uh, increased storm intensity. Uh, I believe uh, these storms are only going to get worse. Governor Chris Christie has promised to build a continuous dune system on the shore no matter what it takes, but it's not likely to be a quick or easy fight. I'm Carolyn Beeler in Bayhead, New Jersey. Back once again, we have a question from the audience. Could you give us your name, please, and your question, if you would? Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Dillingham. I work with a coastal conservation organization called the American Littoral Society here on the shore and over in Jamaica Bay and Broad Channel. My question is about the engineered beaches, the engineered dunes. Because these aren't natural systems, they require very expensive, very long-term maintenance to keep them in place, particularly given the, the stresses we see from rising sea levels and increasing storms. My question is, who pays for that maintenance and have more natural approaches to beach and dune restoration been evaluated? Thanks very much. Uh, Bill Olfeld, do you want to take a, a crack at, uh, at that? Well, it's, it's a great question, and I, one thing I want to point out is that you know, studies show that for every dollar invested in disaster risk reduction, there's a, a fourfold return on that in averted payments as a result, um, one to four. And that's green infrastructure, that's built infrastructure. Um, and I, I think we're going to see over time a combination of sources paying for this. I well, mean, you've been quoted as saying that there is no silver bullet, but we must take bold action. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, I think the point is, when I say there's no silver bullet, it's, it's not simply a seawall or a seagate. You know? So right after Super Swim Sandy, uh, the governor himself of New York was talking about a seagate to protect Manhattan. And you know, after the work of the commission, 
that talk went away and there was a realization that this is going to be a mix. You know, there has to be a broad, diverse portfolio. Well, the mayor said no to seawalls. Pardon me? The mayor said no to well, seawalls. That's correct. And yeah. the mayor has, from the outset, you know, talked about a, a diverse suite of solutions. I think we're going to see federal funding, state funding, and ultimately private individual funding, too. And whether that's through insurance, all kinds of uh, ways, it, it's going to take all of those things because this is a huge challenge that is going to play out over decades and this whole century as we make this whole region resilient in a climate changing world. Nicole Gelinas, the, the idea, I mean, in some respects, obviously, you have questions about the money going for private homes or private businesses or things like that. When a project takes on this dimension and it becomes essentially a public works project, uh, does it fall within kind of your range of acceptability? Sure, but the maintenance question is a very good question. It, building a system of flood walls around New York City might cost $20 billion, probably more. But every single year, you've got to spend 10% of that maintaining it. In our focus on getting federal aid, it prevents us from thinking about that. It's the same thing that we did after 9-11, where you had New York focused intensely on getting its $21 billion from Washington. It turned out after the, uh, during the next decade, New York spent a good deal of that money on the wrong things. And so we ended up digging into our own state and local taxpayer pockets to do the things we were supposed to do with that money. So the money and was not going where it was intended. It, exactly. It cost a lot more than $20 billion, partly because we, we thought of this as free money that came down from, from somewhere it, it, that we hadn't sent it to Washington in the first place. And so we kind of frittered it away and ended up not having built the buildings and so forth that we were supposed to build. So for the congressmen who were the ones holding up this aid <laughs> package, the ones who earned the wrath of Governor Christie, are you saying that they were right? It's very difficult to say no in an acute disaster. But a few years from now, we may be looking at, for example, a subway system that is still not protected from massive floods. So, you know, the MTA has more than 500 points of entry for water to get into the system just in lower Manhattan. So how they go about spending their very finite money is important, not just the money they get right now from Washington, but how are they going to maintain this infrastructure after Washington has forgotten about this disaster and gone on to another one. So the important thing is for the states and local governments to understand this is their responsibility. This is a very wealthy region. We've got to look to ourselves to fund these projects that make us better off. Uh, back to uh, Lincoln Center right now, John Cameron, the chair of the Long Island Regional Planning Council. Uh, with that in mind, is there any way that the, that the money on Long Island <coughs> would be adequate, or the money in New York State would be adequate to do the kind of things necessary to get the island over the damage that's been done and create an environment where damage could be mitigated or avoided in the future. There's going to be adequate money, I would say, to mitigate, uh, but not absolutely not to eliminate the potential in the future. Uh, we're talking about multi-billions of dollars. That's why I said earlier is that we need to prioritize the most critical infrastructure and what cost-effectively develop solutions because we're not going to have sufficient money. We need to look at what's most important, which would really be for public health and safety, which would really be the public electric grid as well as the water and wastewater systems. Once we have those, if we have those fairly well resilient and, uh, and protected, then we can continue to operate. We're not going to be able to uh, satisfy every demand. The money is just not there. But we need to look at it cost effectively. We need to look at also innovative ways to try and approach the problem. Planning is critical. Uh, Jonas Sarah mentioned a word earlier, and the politics of it is very difficult. And once you start talking about when you're in the middle of a disaster, it's OK. Uh, everybody's there. Everybody's pulling in the same direction. Now you talk about afterwards, and you talk about changing building codes, et cetera, and funding, where the money goes. It gets very difficult. And the politics are we have elected officials that respond to their, to their electorate. And uh, we're going to see how well people are, are going to accommodate change. Change is a very difficult concept for people to accept, but it's inevitable, and uh, we need to direct it. All right, uh, let's go to Joe Nocera right now. Joe, I mean, we, we were talking about these, these billions and billions of dollars that were lobbied for and effectively won to uh, deal with some of these issues after the storm. Do you think, I mean, the political battle notwithstanding, do you think the money was 
it's a hard phrase to use, but was the money deserved by this region to the extent that we got that much money? And do you think, do you have any confidence that the money is being used properly? Um, well, you know, deserved. The country does have, you know, the country does tend to um, want to spend money um, in the wake of a disaster to help people out. Um, I think the money that will go to individual homeowners, whatever I happen to think about rebuilding or not, uh, is really going to help those people. I, I made a bunch of calls in the last couple of days to, to homeowners who are basically tearing their hair out. They you know, can't get the FEMA money. They're fighting with the insurance company. They've got a, a house that still has a basement that's a mess. Um, that money is going to be really helpful. Um, the, the question, there is not enough money, even in that big bucket, to do all the infrastructure things that need to be done, even if everybody came together on a plan. Um, there just isn't. Um, and so, it, you know, now, then it becomes a question of how strategic are you going to be? How aligned are you going to be? How much fighting are you going to do? And the answer is we don't really know how that's going to play out yet. We can hope, we can be optimistic. I'm a journalist. I tend not to be optimistic. Um, but we really don't know yet how that bucket of money will be spent or whether it will be spent properly or not. Patrick Murray, back to you right now. I mean, you talk to people. Are people optimistic that this money will be well spent, that the, that the end result will be a good one, will all come out of this, not in a kumbaya moment perhaps, right. but certainly closer together and effectively healed? They've been cautiously optimistic, and uh, we find that a majority of residents say that they're cautiously optimistic that this money will be well spent and will go to where it is. Uh, you know, some of the issues that we find are whether we're going to get the cooperation from all the different levels that it's going to filter down to the people who need it, whether things like the dunes are going to be built that everybody seems to support. In fact, one of the things that we found was that 80 percent of waterfront residents uh, say that they're willing to sign that, those easements uh, to build those dunes. Uh, the, the folks that we saw from Ship Bottom in that taped piece represent only about 15 percent of homeowners. So we're, one of the things that we've been trying to do with the polling that, that we found, we've been doing with the Asbury Park Press and Jersey Shore Partnership and others over the past uh, mo six months is to dispel some of these rumors and find out what the knowledge levels are. I think the big issue, even more so than the money, will be the flood elevations, which is a big issue that people don't understand yet how that's going to affect them. Well, it's been that the governor quickly had the state adopting those maps before the FEMA folks had actually finalized them. Right. And that created a lot of confusion. I'll get back to you in a minute, Commissioner. I can see. <laughs> I, can, I, can see I can see a little something going on there. Yes, sir. A question from the audience. Your name, please, and your question. Yeah, my name is George Casimos. I'm with a grassroots organization called Stop FEMA Now. And the first thing with the dunes in New Jersey is um, we strongly urge the New Jersey Supreme Court justices to hand down a decision on the Harvey Cedars case. We can't move forward and either buy them out or mm -hmm. eminent domain them out until we get that decision, and we need that decision now. And that's the uh, Harvey Cedars case for viewers who don't live in Jersey. Uh, the, the case before the Supreme Court in New Jersey involves an award of $375,000 to a couple for the right to build, a, a, get the easement to build a dune in front of their place. That is correct. And what people need to understand is they're adding land to your property. It's not eminent domain. It's, they call it eminent domain, but they're adding land to your property. So that, that's one of the issues. Uh, New Jersey and the Army Corps of Engineers have been trying to get the dune system built for, for decades now. And if we get the dunes, if we get the elevation, if, if we get the um, easements, will our elevation go down significantly? Will our flood insurance rates go down significantly? And when's that going to happen? When, you know, if we got the easements, when can that happen from the commander in the Army Corps of Engineers? Thank Great you. questions. Vital questions. Commissioner, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know nothing about that subject. <laughs> but I, I just want to um, circle back to some discussion that was occurring before and some comments that were made before. Yes, sir. The, the money, the federal dollars, are certainly monies that are needed. Um, they're needed in Belmar, they're needed in Hoboken, they're needed by businesses, by communities, by individuals. So there's definitely a need. And as with regard to um, is there any confidence from, uh, you know, New Jerseyans, I can't speak for what's going on in New York, but confidence from New Jerseyans that the monies will be meant well spent. 
I will tell you unequivocally that the monies in New Jersey will be, you know, well spent. They'll be planned out. We're going to build smarter, uh, safer, and more resilient. And the governor has put the controller in charge of making sure that that actually occurs. From, from, a, from a compliance standpoint, it's extremely important. Obviously, there's a need for funds. Just briefly, in the Gulf Coast, uh, right after Katrina, uh, hundreds, billions and billions of dollars uh, were spent. But recently, uh, a uh, HUD OIG audit came out, and there were $700 million that were wasted. They were given away to individuals in $100,000 clips, and they never spent it on housing. That's not going to happen here in New Jersey. All right. Uh, Peter Reinhardt, let's talk about the real estate aspect sure. of this, because obviously, people, these are their homes, their treasures, and there's so much uncertainty right now with this. Talk to me about what you're observing here and specifically address some of those concerns if you can. Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 there's sort of a paralysis due to uncertainty. Uh, unless you have a lot of your own independent wealth and can afford to move ahead regardless, uh, you, you're still, for the most part, paralyzed. The FEMA maps are not finalized. We don't know what those final base flood elevations are going to be. Not sure how much the insurance costs are going to be. And as I said, unless you're independently wealthy, you can't really move ahead yet until you know just what those costs are going to be. And for and, go ahead. And, and that moving ahead could be for people who want to stay or people who would like to go. And a lot of people who yeah. said we'd like to go say, I can't afford to sell. Well, it's interesting. Just before we went on the air tonight, Governor Christie announced a $300 million program, uh, Blue Acres, it's been called different things, where that would actually buy out uh, the, uh, homes in Sayreville? In yeah. Sayreville, right. Little Falls, mm -hmm. those sort of, and, and some of the sandy areas. So that at least is, is a glimmer of hope for some of those people who really have no choice. Uh, so Let, Let's go back to Lincoln Center right now. Richard Ravitch, um, you served in private industry for years. You were the lieutenant governor of the state of New York. I mean, is, is the state of New York, uh, I mean, there is Obviously, momentum, uh, Governor Cuomo has pushed for the same type of program of buying people out of flood-prone areas. Uh, do you think it's a wise move? Do you th at first, I guess, can the state afford that move? You know, I think it's important to recognize that dealing with the risk of a natural disaster and the rising water table is not the only problem that we face in this country. Uh, and there are enormous amount of competition for limited public resources for a lot of arguably equally compelling public problems. Uh, this country is underspending on its public infrastructure in the most uh, serious way to begin with. The Chinese spend eight times as high a percentage of their GDP on infrastructure as we do that you talk to anybody about the quality of our highway system or our public transportation system. Uh, and, and we are underspending to a dramatic degree. So the issue of, of how we allocate limited resources uh, is an important issue that ultimately the President and the Congress of the United States are the ones that are going to have to make that decision. And it's very easy in the abstract when, you're not, uh, when you don't have to conjure with the competitive demands for limited resources or um, for the fact that there's an enormous resistance to the imposition of taxes, even though the money might be spent on very noble causes. These are the political realities that we have to deal with. So I think uh, of course, Governor Cuomo cares about doing this to the, to the utmost degree as possible to make this system uh, uh, as, as insulated from uh, the risks of, uh, of another storm. But on the other hand, uh, he's got 20 other problems. He's got collapsing bridges. He's got public transportation systems. He's got cities that don't have enough money to rebuild their schools. He has enormous pressures, and he faces a problem of a lot of people not wanting to pay more taxes. So how the, the issue of the, the storm uh, is going to play in the context of the total uh, competition, as I said, for limited resources, is the central question that our society has to conjure with now.
Not an easy question to answer, obviously. We have another question now that was uh, taped in New York and recorded earlier. Listen. Hi, my name is Timothy Hood, and I live in Brooklyn. I'm just curious when the people are going to start taking emergency preparations seriously. All right. Uh, a brief question, but a direct question. Uh, Joan O'Sara, uh, you wanted us to get back to you? We're not going to let you go now. Talk to us about the individual's responsibility to take these kind of dangers seriously. Oh, well, in the first place, let's just give some credit where it's due. Um, there were, the reason so few people died in Sandy, in New York, was precisely because um, the city has a terrific uh, preparedness plan in place, uh, and they had a good evacuation plan. And, um, you know, you had a, a giant neighborhood that burned down uh, where nobody was injured. And the reason for that is because they were all gone. So, so I, I feel like you got to give some credit here and say that uh, the city did a very good job. Uh, uh, getting people ready for the fact that this was a real serious, this was a serious storm that had to be taken seriously. Um, to me, the, the larger problem came in the immediate aftermath, where uh, neither the city, the state, nor the federal, federal government was in any way prepared to deal with the immediate needs of the people right after the storm. And that's, you know, thank goodness we are a country where people help each other, because that's the only way, really, people get back on their feet in the immediate aftermath. So to me, the big need was not immediately before, but immediately after. Uh, Colonel Boulay, we've talked with you about, about preparations. Uh, talk to me now about the process of dealing with the aftermath that Joe was just referring to, and using that aftermath to take the next step to get ahead of the curve. No, it's, it's, it's a challenging question, and, and when I said we have to move slowly before, Mike, what I, what I meant really is we don't want to jump too quickly to the wrong, uh, the, the wrong strategies, and that's what I mean. We, we've got to do some careful analysis uh, before we uh, uh, decide how we're going to invest limited funds. You know, $60 billion, it's a lot of money, but it's limited uh, to uh, some of these rebuilding solutions. And, you know, my colleague here, John Cameron, had a great uh, a point that he made about prioritizing. And, and really, it, it goes to the point uh, that you talked about, Joe, with uh, preparation. Re really, when you're it's, it's a risk management exercise. And you want to find a way to reduce the risk to the public to the lowest level that you can afford. And you can do some of that in the preparation phase. You can do some of that in the response and recovery phase. And then you can do some of that in the mitigation phase where we are now. And what we need to do is move deliberately in the mitigation phase to really address those communities that are at the highest risk. Okay, we have to look at the probability of, of flooding in the case of, uh, of a coastal storm and the severity of that flooding. And quite frankly, that, that varies across the region depending on where you are. And so we should look at that risk and we should measure that risk scientifically. And then we should look at investing our limited funds early in the areas that are at the most risk. And as we move forward in this, in this you know, I'm an old army guy, as we move forward in this war, because that's what it is, and it's going to take some time to win it, uh, then, then we start attacking some of the other areas as, uh, you know, the capital... Uh, becomes available to make continued invest investments. And then we knock down that risk uh, as we go. And, and we look at that as a, in, a, in a deliberate fashion. I, I think that's a good way to approach the problem. Well, Colonel, you led us exactly where we want to be going right now with a look ahead. Where do we go from here right now? Where will things stand when we reach, say, the one-year anniversary, about six months from now? And remember, we are only two weeks away from the beginning of hurricane season. Uh, Sheena Wright, President and CEO of United Way of New York City, you've had enormous challenges thrown your way in the last half year. Where do we go from here? I think, you know, what we've discussed here is that the, the, the challenge is enormous. The resources are not there to match the current challenge. So we do have to be smart. We do have to be strategic. We absolutely have to prioritize. 
I think there has to be an advocacy platform. I mean, one of the things um, I think that you know Joe is bringing up a, a bit is the politics, and with so many challenges before our leaders, they have to pick where to make the investments. So we do need maybe a, an advocacy campaign where people are saying we need di investments directed in these strategic places where we're going to get the most bang for our bucks. So I think that's that's something that we should think about and organize around. Okay, uh, Commissioner Constable, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean. We're at a good place now, finally, in that we're starting to get the federal monies to flow. It's been too slow, candidly, but it's the, the faucet's about to open. Um, so hopefully in the in the next few weeks uh, over the summer, uh, you're going to see homes starting to be rebuilt. You're going to see business with capital to start to, to move forward. And, but more than just that, we also have to be smart from a long-range planning standpoint. Uh, we have to re-engineer beaches. We have to talk about, you know, where we're going to rebuild certain communities. So a year from today, obviously, we're going to be a lot better off than where we are. And the, the last point is we have to engage everyone in it, the philanthropic community, American Red Cross, and, and our partners there, as well as, as state and local officials. Mayor Darty, where do we go from here? Um, well, I can tell you in Belmar, uh, we are going to start off the uh, summer season with a brand new boardwalk. Uh, Governor Christie is going to be joining us uh, next Wednesday, uh, May 22nd, for that new boardwalk. Uh, and we'll be prepared for middle class families to come to the Jersey Shore again, create new memories. And uh, I think we have to be uh, optimistic about our future. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's only been a little over six months since San Sandy came through. Um, so, you know, it's still a pretty emotional time. But I think with, with the brain power we have and the resources in this area, uh, I think that we can move ahead forward uh, and look forward to a great future here in, in New Jersey and New York. Go back to Lincoln Center. Richard Ravitch, same question to you, sir. Where do we go from here? Well, I, don't, I prefer to be an optimist also. And I think that, as I said earlier, uh, we have a big problem in this country in confronting all the totality of our infrastructure issues, of which the risks of, of these disasters is only one part. And I, I hope and expect that the government at all levels, at the state level uh, and particularly at the federal level, because that's where the deepest pockets are, are going to make some effort to do what everybody has agreed on tonight, which is that we have to prioritize. We have to recognize that this is going to happen again. We have to recognize the forces of nature are uh, rise, causing a rise in the, in the water table, and that is a permanent and growing threat to the coastal areas. Uh, and, and we need a, a public, discussion and some guts on the part of the people in politics to make the decisions, tell the public what their priorities are, and not just sit and wait until something else bad happens again. John Cameron, where does Long Island go from here? Long Island needs to plan s smartly, and it needs to have the courage to implement the difficult decisions governmentally and individually. And frankly, our children, their future and their quality of their lives depend upon those decisions as well as our grandchildren. We need to make those difficult decisions and uh, to make sure that they happen. Uh, Bill Alfelder, where do we go from here? The key in all of this, these are all great points, but is flexibility. You know, some places it, it is hard solutions and built, and in other places it's softer, and in other places it's, it's making way for nature. And, People who are looking to relocate and put, place themselves out of harm's way, that they have those opportunities to do that as well. So I think it, a key is really a flexible approach. And Ralph LaRosa, last word. Where do we go from here? Well, I'll tell you what I heard tonight. I heard there's a new reality. We had Irene, we had Sandy, we had freak snowstorms. We have to embrace that new reality, have our emergency plans in place, both industry, government, and individuals. And then we have to step up and do some things that just have to be done right now. Uh, we're not waiting for somebody to tell us to fix the substation that was feeding the, the refineries. We're out there doing that. So we heard that. We need to do that. And finally, prioritize, put the prioritizations in place, and then execute on a plan. And, and we were talking about, you know, some of the plans, things like that. You've actually, I mean, your plan is a $4 billion plan? 
for it's, where we go from here? It's actually just over $5 billion. And it, and it spans everything from those substations that I talked about in the beginning all the way to communications back to the customer in a way that they, they would be happy to have information about their home, not just generic information about the grid. Uh, Mayor Zimmer. Where, do, where does Hoboken go from here? Well, we keep focusing on making, I mean, my focus is on urban America, uh, Hoboken being an urban municipality. We keep focusing on, on becoming more resilient, whether that's, you know, we're working on expanding our CERT team and educating the public. I truly believe that if we can help the community to be prepared in an urban environment, you can shelter within your home. And so that, that on top of the individual being more prepared and, you know, we want to have plans for, getting people to move their cars and people just listening to us and, and getting, moving their cars and, and, uh, and also when you think about the rebuilding efforts, the new standards that we can put in place to make sure that, again, those elevators operate, the hallway lights operate, the exit lights operate, the community rooms have, have lights. Those are things that, that we, can, we can put those standards in place and hopefully there'll be grant money available to make those things happen so that in the urban environment, people can be resilient and stay within their homes and shelter within their homes. But you said if and grants and money. Are you optimistic you can get all that? Well, we certainly have expanded. We've had a tremendous response on our community emergency response team. Just completed a training program, expanding another training program, and we'll be out there, you know, educating the public on how they can be prepared to stay within their home. And uh, we'll be, you know, we're, as people come in to get permits and rebuilding, we're, you know, advocating for them to, to build higher, build stronger. And uh, I'm certainly uh, down talking to everyone in Trenton. I think they're tired of seeing me. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> so. we, we have to leave it there. But please continue the conversation with us on Twitter using the hashtag SandyTownHall. And as soon as we sign off here, please sign on to SandyTownHall.org to join a, a Google and hang out with and chat with Colonel John Boulay. We want to thank our hosts here at Monmouth University, at the University President Paul Gaffney, all of the media organizations that supported this program, our panelists right here on Monmouth University's campus, and at the Tisch WNET studios in New York City, and of course, our live audiences who were so respectful and asked such wonderful questions here in, uh, in uh, New Jersey, and of course, to the audience as well in New York City. Uh, on a personal note, uh, for those of us at NJTV and the organizations that uh, put on this uh, program tonight, we truly appreciate the opportunity to come into your homes to provide this kind of information and to uh, interact with you. Uh, it is a privilege for us to be able to cover the story of this region and a pri privilege as well to cover the recovery as we move ahead. I'm Mike Schneider. Thanks very much for watching us and have a good night.